not anything really new when we're looking at the investigation into accused murderer Brian Koberger to find pieces of his past. It's been going on since very, very early on. Some of the interesting pieces included the uh, revelations from former uh, students, former teachers of where he was a teaching assistant from uh, what we believe to be his writings online about seeing visual snow and being disconnected from emotions and his family and and feeling very off uh, and and several others. But there's a new one that we have to talk to you about today. How about that? I feel like more and more is going to keep popping up as time goes on. You know, I I feel like the more people get talked to about this guy, because I feel like we don't know enough about him. We know about the the potential crimes, but... I want to hear about him in high school. I want to hear about him in college. What was he mm-hmm. like leading up to these this this ultimate moment? Well, from everything that we've heard and everything that we know, it very much, or he very much allegedly fits the profile, I think, that a lot of us have of him, of being very awkward with women and people, uh, very intense, and mm-hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, I'm giggling just just a hair because you and I have worked with people who fit this exact description. Oh, and I wouldn't be surprised if they have bodies somewhere, too. Uh, yeah, some of those people were it's like, and by the way, um, but in this uh, case, we're going to take a look at some of the troubling history of Koberger, who's now 28. He's, of course, facing the charges of murdering the four University of Idaho students. Uh, well, he'd been previously expelled from a high school law enforcement program. Oh, boy. The reason? Multiple complaints about his behavior, primarily from female students. Oh, God. Not, again, not surprising. This is a guy who fits that profile. There's plenty of guys who are very awkward around women that really, they're just awkward dudes uh, and, and really have nothing bad that they're going to do. They're just awkward. And there's plenty that are just fucking beyond that and weird and maybe are going to do crazy horrible things like the allegations against uh, Koberger. Koberger's aspiration to join the ranks of law enforcement, they weren't secret at all. It goes all the way back to high school when he was a student at Monroe Career and Technical Institute. He was a part of their law enforcement program. However, as Tanya Camella Beers, a former administrative uh, administrator rather of the Institute, revealed uh, his behavior led to his eventual removal the program Camilla Beers was quoted as saying to the Daily Mail Koberger wasn't going to end up in the police academy she further explained that he had taken the program extremely serious but his path took a turn after a group of female students lodged a complaint against him while she refrained from going into specific details due to student privacy laws she noted that the circumstances leading to his exit now makes sense And also, if we add up some of the other things that we've heard about him from in college and the complaints against him there, it all adds up. On November 13th, tragedy obviously struck at the University of Idaho when uh, Kaylee Gonsalves, Madison Mogan, Zaina Kernodal, and Ethan Chapin were all found dead in their off-campus residence. Koberger, with his once cherished dreams of law enforcement, now stands as the primary suspect. In those heinous crimes, Koberger's subsequent activities after being dismissed from the law enforcement program also raised some eyebrows. He transferred to a heating, ventilation, and air conditioning course after being kicked out of the law enforcement course, but dropped out a year later. (laughs) Just uh, There's something weird about that. You still have access to people's homes. Yes, I was just going to go there. Were you? Yeah, I was just thinking that myself. Go ahead. I mean, that's where my mind was going. Yeah, I'm thinking like the cable repair guy or uh, an appliance repair, you know, somebody who has to come into people's homes where, you know, maybe you've stayed home from work because they're going to come between eight and three. So you've got this huge window where you're home alone waiting for the repair guy and it's just you and the repair guy. And it's this awkward moment. Those, you know, there's just a few jobs like that where you invite a stranger into your home. And that's one of them. Uh, Without a doubt. Uh, And if there's been parallels drawn to BTK, and I don't think there's really a ton of really strong ones, 
um, to BTK, but uh, BTK was an ADT security salesperson. I didn't know that. Yeah. He sold Ugh. ADT. I mean, so you're, it's a person you're calling to secure your home. And keep you safe. Potentially being the person who ends up killing you. Uh, and, and yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, that is a scary prospect of, you know, these people you invite in their home and like, well, they're here to do this or that. And you hope they're on the up and up. But if they're not, you have someone in your home. Uh, he uh, used his brief stint in the law enforcement program to secure a part time security guard position at Mount Pleasant High School. His tenure there was also short lived, ending with a forced resignation under mysterious circumstances. So every time he's been in like a law enforcement position or attempting to be in a law enforcement position uh, or, or just some sort of security type position, it's never ended well. Oh, they're looking at it going. Something's up with this guy. 110%. We're talking about the class in high school. We're talking about the forced resignation of being the security guard at Mount Pleasant high school. Uh, and we're also uh, talking about he was his application when he was in um, in Idaho, uh, where he was trying to get into law enforcement there as well. The application was there, and we don't really know exactly how far that actually went, other than he didn't get far or never even got accepted uh, into any sort of position there. That's never truly been uh, cleared up, because there was some concern early on that, well, did he have access to, like, security cameras or traffic cameras or something around the city or anything like that to, to track people. We don't truly know the answer to that yet. It was, uh, high school years are also marked by personal transformations. According to close friends, uh, Casey Arntz and Bree, uh, he faced weight related bullying, leading them to lose nearly a hundred pounds during his senior year. However, the physical transformation was accompanied by a behavioral shift as well. Koberger started exhibiting bullying behavior himself, targeting Arnett's brother with physical aggression. Bree also highlighted another disturbing development, Koberger's descent into drug use, notably heroin. A report from uh, DailyMail.com further paints the picture of a man who consistently made others, especially women, uncomfortable. This behavior extended into his adult life. Jordan Solnuck, owner of a Pennsylvania bar, described Koberger as someone who made creepy comments and was aggressive towards female staff. Additionally, during his tenure as a teaching assistant at Washington State, Koberger faced accusations of sexism. He's, of course, pled not guilty. He's set to face trial on October 2nd. The judge uh, reinforcing that just last week in that pretrial hearing. The pretrial hearings have been very contentious. The defense demands more time to address potential procedural issues with a grand jury indictment from May, and they're also pushing for further disclosure of the DNA profiles that prosecutors plan to use. The latest on that pretrial hearing uh, from last week, in case you didn't catch that, uh, the uh, the judge has said, no, we're not getting more time. We're following our schedule as of right now. Uh, and he has yet, as of our recording this, to make a decision on uh, the DNA uh, and the profiles and how much he feels is appropriate to release to the defense um, uh, to look at. It's interesting to note that the things that they're trying to look at in the DNA profiles uh, and, and the genealogy matching are pieces that uh, the prosecution isn't even planning on bringing up in court. Oh, wow. So the reason to look at it, Megan, I don't know. It's like, this isn't part of the case. We're not going to even use this. We're telling you right now, we're not going to use this. Why? Why? What do you want? I mean, it's not. Yeah, why are they even talking about it? <laughs> there, there's nothing in here that's going to be in your defense. I mean, it, it's just all... I feel like the Koberger defense keeps going down roads that they think may lead somewhere, but in the end, it's like there's dead end signs or like giant cliff ahead signs, and they just keep pressing the gas, hoping that maybe a deer will run in front of us and stop the car. I don't know. Man, they're just grasping, aren't they? That's really uh, how it feels. Uh, I, I just did a, a piece yesterday here on the podcast. Uh, talking about one of their experts that they brought in. And I'm not, in, in no way, shape, or form, am I trying to disparage this, uh, this biologist or, or their expertise in, in genealogy, because it seems that they do have a lot of experience there, but it's more so on a consumer standpoint level of someone trying to find their loved one. 
there's nothing on this woman's website that has anything to do with criminal investigations or matching DNA in a criminal type case the way that they're trying to do it here. It's someone, it was an expert witness that was able to testify um, to what they do. And the way you word questions, if you're the attorney, you can get somewhat usable answers out that could easily confuse a jury. I don't think this witness was trying to confuse anybody. They're just trying to answer their questions. But I think that is the goal. It's make as much of a gray, smoky area as you possibly can around everything here. And hopefully at least one of those people on that jury is going to be dumb enough to go, well, you know, uh, maybe you got a point here. Like, There's no fact to anything they're saying, but well, you know, maybe they do. And that right there can hang a jury. Uh, it, it can lead to uh, an acquittal. It can lead to a lot of things. And that I really feel is what they are. I, I, they're trying to do that, obviously, before they even have a jury. But I think one of the bigger things is they're trying to create enough doubt, number one, that death is taken off the table. Yeah, I think you nailed it. And they're just looking for just that shadow of a doubt. Can you get that off? If Koberger's death is off the table, uh, they've done their job. And Ann Taylor uh, can walk away feeling satisfied, even if he is sentenced to uh, life in prison. Going to be very interesting to watch as this uh, continues to uh, inch closer and closer to October 2nd. What say you, Stacy? Are we going to make the October 2nd date? Or is there going to be something that happens between now and then that I, delays? This I'm, I'm going to go with something's going to happen and I can't quite predict what it's going to be, but it's going to be some sort of a bombshell that's going to delay things another six months. Scooby-Doo was involved in the investigation and he yep. licked the knife sheath. That yep. is what's going to happen. You're locked into the Hidden Killers podcast. Want more? Start binging on all of our true crime podcasts right now through Apple Podcasts and get an ad-free experience when you sign up to be a True Crime Today Premium Plus member exclusively on Apple Podcasts. More of the Hidden Killers podcast dropping soon. Press subscribe now.